Good morning. Does that work at all? Where's IT? <laughs> Good morning. Oh, there you go. <laughs> you wouldn't mind taking your seats? <laughs> Did you have a hard line? Yeah. Sit. Well, it's teachers. Um, so good morning. Uh, thank you for uh, making the journey, the uh, hopefully not too rough commute to Humber College. Uh, my name is Mark Enad. I'm the director of e-learning here at Humber College. Uh, I'm Christine Eddy. I'm the heads of CE, the chair of heads of CE right now. I'm with Loyalist College. <laughs> right now. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see so by the end of the day how this goes. <laughs> A lot is riding on today for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you'll all get rubrics and yeah. you will. Um, so we are really uh, pleased and excited to see all of you. We had up to 150 people register um, for this Heads of Sea conference. Uh, and we are really proud and happy to bring the Heads of Sea conference back online. It's something that used to happen annually. Uh, it's been about six or seven years. Uh, and we felt there was a need and an urge uh, and a desire uh, to bring it back and to and to get you know the colleges talking again when it comes to the um, to the, you know the, to the future of CE when it comes to uh, when it comes to the province. So um, Christine and and others have worked really hard to to make this happen, um, and we really hope you enjoy the day. There are a number of great workshops um, and great keynote speakers, and uh, I think it's just going to be a fabulous day. Um, so before uh, we bring up our keynote speaker, I would like to uh, bring up our uh, uh, outgoing uh, Associate Vice President of Teaching and Learning, uh, Eileen DeCourcy. Appreciate it. It's really a delight to be here today. Um, continuing education, I mean, you guys are really at the forefront of where the education system is going. There is no doubt in my mind that continuing ed 
is going to lead a kind of renaissance in how we deal with learners. And that's what I want to talk about today and just give you some insights about that and get a sense of your thought processes as you think about expanding services, marketing to more students, being more selective and clinical in the way that you provide services to students that really meet their needs. That is the secret of 2018, is really meeting the learner where they are. Any of you, were, were any of you at the Learning Outcomes uh, Symposium that the Council of Ontario Universities sponsored three weeks ago? Anyone? Interesting. One of the observations I have about Ontario, and I wish it would go away, is that things happen either in the university domain or in the college domain. I'm from British Columbia, and I can tell you that if you go to an event in British Columbia, you find a complete mix of people from universities and colleges. And it's a healthy interaction about thinking, about ways of knowing, about understanding the context in which everyone else operates. So you're going to get a little five-minute snippet, actually, of the Learning Outcomes Conference from three weeks ago on the front end of this. My email address is there, Twitter too. Um, what I want to start with is this notion of renaissance and kind of a rebirth of thinking about how we do a great job for learners to meet their needs and at the same time deal with the realities of the economic context in which we work and the fact that many, many students are interested in nothing else but employment when they come through our doors. We need to think seriously about that. My world used to be really smooth. I worked. Uh, in the higher education system in British Columbia, college and university. I've worked in the K-12 system there as well. And I remember the days of planning for things that were going to come up a semester or two downstream. But over the last few years, it started to look like this. And there's always either an emergent opportunity, a government change, an economic crisis. Something happens that requires us to be even more responsive to change and to think seriously about how we reposition the work we do to meet the context of the day. It's not enough to bring the thinking we had previously to the game today. It just doesn't work that well when you work that way. And for many, any time there's something new happening, it's often hard to make the choice about which way to go. And you really have to have a compass, a set of principles, a strategic thinking perspective to begin to think about how you move forward in that rapidly changing environment. I think that one of the signals about the change in how continuing education might respond downstream was when in Vancouver and Toronto, coding academies sprung up everywhere. King and Spadina in Toronto, in Vancouver, around Gastown. And the idea was that a single focus for a lot of young people was to get a good job in the IT industry. And they weren't sure they wanted to take a three-year program to get there. When coding academies were offering 18-week programs guaranteeing employment at the end. Those kinds of ideas, I think, caused us to think differently about how we structure programs and courses in 2017 and 2018. So this is Red Academy's front page from a year ago, and they were claiming they were redefining education. And I think we, collectively, have taken up that challenge and said we can do it better, cheaper, and with higher quality than they can. And I think that is a good thing. And that's the strength of this community, 
you have good ideas, good instructors, and the infrastructure to make this kind of education work and respond to change effectively. We've been doing some meta-analysis at eCampus Ontario about the trends in continuing education. And every time you turn around, there's a newsletter or a headline. Ten trends, three trends, five trends, seven trends that we need to pay attention to. If you start to look more deeply at those trends, they begin to cluster. And this is one of the clustering activities we've done. Sometimes it's about user focus, on-demand, self-directed, self-driven micro-learning. Sometimes it's about the way the experience is delivered, hybrid, immersive, open, free resources, mix and match with support. Lots of programs looking at other ways of thinking. Alternative credentialing, how you get rewarded or recognized. Micro-certifications. Last mile training, that's the newest word. The notion, especially for university students, that once they finish that arts degree, they may not be employable. And it's a last mile finishing school experience that often prepares them to get their foot in the door. The other is the kind of relationship we have with our community. School and business collaborations, custom events for training, partnerships with employers to ensure a steady stream of practicums. And you all are doing this. But the newest idea is the notion of competency marketplaces. And the idea that somewhere you will need to catalog all of your competencies to match them up with opportunities downstream. And there are lots of people working in this domain. This is LinkedIn's bread and butter. The problem is that LinkedIn has no authentication trail currently. On LinkedIn, I could be a nuclear physicist. There's nothing that authenticates me from that website that that is true, but that is likely going to change. So my question for you is continuing education at the vanguard of a renaissance in innovative program design for post-secondary education. I think you are. I think you haven't actually spotted it yet. I think that the conference on learning outcomes that I attended with the university faculty and staff three weeks ago scared the bejesus out of them. And I'm going to give you a snippet of the keynote speaker's presentation. It wasn't popular, but I think it'll resonate totally with the work that you do. And you tell me afterwards. I'll be able to tell by the smiles <laughs> or the nods. That will be my indicator. So when I say renaissance, I'm talking about a rebirth of thinking. All of us got into education for the same reason. That is to help our fellow humans advance themselves and do better. It's about a social consciousness. It's about a, a willingness to share knowledge and to help others contribute to the economy and to society. Be great neighbors, great friends, a good part of the citizenry. But to get it right, you have to be sensitive to context and the emergent learner dynamics. Students these days are auditioning you and your programs as much as you're auditioning them to take them. And you have to keep that in mind. And they're very social media aware. So if you're doing something not so great, they're going to tell all their friends. You have to be aware about how that work happens. Ryan Craig was the keynote speaker at the Council of Ontario Universities Learning Outcomes Conference. His speech was on last mile education. He's written a new book called New You, Faster and Cheaper Alternatives to College. He's an American. And he was roundly panned by the audience because he was an American. 
But sometimes you have to look and cast a wider net than simply within Canada to see what's going on. I'm constantly looking at Australia, New Zealand, Europe to see what's happening. My reference points are, are places in the UK often for advanced thinking about using technology. We have to cast a wider net. Here's Ryan Craig. This is a five minute snippet from 2017. You can find it on YouTube where he explains the thesis of his book. Whoops. I thought I had that down to an art form. <laughs> the single biggest change uh, we've seen uh, in American higher education over the last decade is not massive open online courses or even digitization, uh, let alone uh, 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 coding boot camps. Uh, the single biggest change we've seen uh, is that about a decade ago, only 50% or so of students said that the primary or exclusive reason why they were enrolling in a higher education program related to employment or getting a job. And today that percentage is well north of 90%. So we have a new generation of students who are enrolling in higher education solely or primarily for the purpose of getting a job. At the same time, we have a system of colleges and universities uh, who are uh, as uh, uh, independent uh, from uh, the workforce and who are as disconnected uh, from employers as they were a decade ago. And that situation is changing quickly and needs to change. Um, it's changing in a couple of, uh, in a couple of ways. For students who are currently uh, in uh, uh, higher education institutions studying uh, degree programs, we're seeing the emergence of last mile training providers, these intermediaries who are providing students with the technical, primarily technical, skills uh, that employers are seeking. Uh, technical skills now outnumber cognitive and non-cognitive skills in uh, employer job descriptions in virtually every sector of the economy in America now. And of course, students who don't have those requisite technical skills uh, are effectively invisible uh, to employers because they're simply not making it past the application tracking system or ATS keyword-based filters uh, that employers utilize uh, to filter and manage uh, the hundreds of applications they get for every open position. Uh, so these last mile training providers are providing students with uh, coding skills, other technical skills, sales skills uh, that employers are seeking uh, to consider uh, them for, uh, for, for employment. In the longer term, uh, we see the emergence of competency marketplaces, which will usher in uh, the change from degree and pedigree-based hiring, uh, which we currently have now, uh, to a competency-based uh, hiring uh, model. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if you have a LinkedIn profile, today your LinkedIn profile uh, is a summation of your experience in education. Now imagine if that profile actually uh, detailed your competencies. And by competencies, I don't simply mean uh, hard and technical skills. Uh, I mean critical thinking, abilities, problem solving, communication, executive function uh, skills, really anything that determines uh, success uh, in a career across any profession. Now if you had a competency profile like that, uh, you, might, you, you would be able to match it uh, against uh, careers that you were interested in pursuing. You'd be able to ascertain uh, what the gap was uh, between where you are and where you want to go. Uh, you might be able to figure out uh, which programs of study uh, would be most effective in helping to fill that gap uh, and get you into the consideration set for that employment. So that's where we're, that's where we're heading. Uh, there are hundreds of uh, universities and companies who are in the process uh, of building out uh, some version of a competency marketplace, allowing students uh, to surface their competencies beneath the level of the terminal credential and match it uh, to uh, two degrees. Uh, and when we have that, what we'll have is effectively uh, is a global positioning system, or GPS, for human capital development, uh, which will be much more effective than the system we have now, uh, which is degree-based, uh, and where virtually half uh, of uh, the working uh, population is excluded uh, from uh, good and desirable jobs simply because they, so they don't have that
bachelor's degree uh, credential. Uh, so that's where we see things, uh, things going. Uh, it will be a fairer system. Uh, it will be a more open system. Uh, the challenges for universities uh, who've really had uh, a monopoly uh, on uh, higher education uh, credentials and post-secondary education uh, credentials and have been able to operate in splendid isolation from the, dem the demands of the workforce, uh, that is going to change uh, dramatically. Uh, institutions that wish to continue to thrive and grow enrollment will need to become much more connected uh, with uh, the employers uh, they're ultimately serving. So you can get a sense of why Ryan was popular with the university crowd. <laughs> it was really a really interesting lunchtime speech because there were a few of us in the room who were thinking, hmm, this is really thought-provoking, and how might we harness some of this research that his company has done to begin to think about how we could address this overwhelming focus of students on employment and how could we help students to surface knowledge they have, perhaps from programs they've taken in institutions, but don't have any way of showing what they actually know. And that is why we have focused a lot of our work at eCampus Ontario on this notion of the T-shaped student. We know that our institutions do a splendid job, universities and college, of giving students deep domain skills. They do that very well. We're really good at that. The question is, what about those cross-domain skills that actually are part of the leverage you need to get a good job and that situate you well once you get that job? Even makes you a great citizen, too. The opportunity to work with people in teams, the understanding of ethics across multiple domains and disciplines. These are the kinds of skills that we're interested in, too, and figuring out how we could help students to surface that knowledge. Now, some people are doing that with a portfolio system now. That's one way to do it. But we would suggest that the actual portfolio you need is the Internet itself. That is your portfolio. Not some closed system in an institution, but something much, much broader. One of the strategies the previous government had, and we expect will be continued with the current government, is our partnership with LinkedIn Learning for lynda.com. It's actually going to be called LinkedIn Learning. It's being rebranded currently. And as you know, we were able to negotiate a very good price, close to zero, for every student, faculty member, and staff member in Ontario's universities and colleges. And that was based on the notion that government believes in hearing from industry that there is a skills gap, that a skills gap exists between what employers are looking for and what our system produces. We're not so sure. We think it may be something to do with how students represent what they know. But in any case, this is a bold experiment for three years. It is being adopted on campuses across Ontario currently. And we are nowhere near full adoption on every campus. I can tell you that the college sector is by far a bigger adopter than the university sector currently. And that many of the things that are happening are experimental on campuses about is this a substitute resource for something I already use in my course? Is it an ancillary resource to expand the knowledge that I impart to students in my course? Or is it something else? a co-curricular kind of activity that gives students additional skill to take into the workplace. We're working with the Higher Education Quality Council of Ontario to actually do this research right now. We're doing the bulk of the research in 2019 because we're only in the ramp up phase now. But we did an initial study with 6,000 students in June 2018 
And I'll tell you a little bit about what we found out from that study. The numbers continue to climb from the first, there were about 100,000 users in the province when we first signed the license and implemented. It's doubled since then, and we expect it to continue to grow. The question we asked is, is there a skills gap? If so, what skills are students interested in? And does this particular mode of delivery work for them? Now, this is way too small for you, but I'll just give you the gist of it. We thought students would be working on this. They're working on vertical, sharpening the skills they already have to be better at them. I took an analytics course using R at my institution. I'm now looking at RapidMinder, another way of using analytics to do an even better job. That's what they're actually doing. They're interested in those soft skills, but they're not sure that 20-minute videos are the ticket to learn them. They're very honest. We're doing a deeper dive with focus groups currently to find out what it is that students need, want, and think they're deficient in. All of this, you can have these slides when I'm done. I'll make a PDF available and everyone can have them. And you can take a deeper look at some of this research. So one of the other things we're pursuing is recognition of learning and rethinking that. And this goes to the problem that students have a lot of skills, they just don't know how to show them. How do we do that? What does it look like from a badging perspective, for example? And this is an area of practice that is growing in the province. There are currently about 10 badging pilots happening that we've sponsored, five in universities, five in colleges. People looking at what would a competency framework look like for me to award a badge? What happens to that badge? Where does it get stored? And what does the authentication trail look like so that I can actually certify that the student has those skills? Important to think that way. The big thing about badging is the critique that it is certified by a recognized brand, that it aligns to employer or industry standards, that it actually demonstrates proof of skills, and that it articulates skills that are real. That is the critical piece when you design a badging infrastructure and when you design a badging program on your campus. Humber has been very bold in this area. We currently have a digital badging structure happening for some program work this fall. That's cool. Because not only have they set it up really well, the website explains it extremely well in terms that an employer or a student can understand. It talks about the benefits. It talks about the architecture. It talks about the components that fit together to allow you to take that badge certification and probably transcriptable information, too, forward with you. What we have in Ontario is a growing badge ecosystem. We're working with CanCred Factory, and Don Prezant will be here this afternoon to talk about this in a lot more detail. But these are some of the institutions that are playing in the badging space currently. And one of the things you need is a place to put your badges so that they're completely portable and persist over time. And that's the piece that we funded at eCampus Ontario. It's called a badge passport. We have a piece of infrastructure in the province where you can post your badge to and have it live there in perpetuity. And at some point when LinkedIn can accept badges, you can take that badge and post it onto your LinkedIn profile, and it'll trace all the way back to the passport and back to the institution that awarded you that badge. It's an alternative credential, and it's usually made up of micro units of study. So the badges can be exported to web pages. So you're beginning to see 
a set of technical infrastructure building. Then you'll hear the word blockchain at some point. And many of these badges will ultimately live on the blockchain and travel with you forever, unalterable and always verifiable. And that is the strength of thinking in this area, that it is a technical infrastructure that works for the individual, that is under the individual's control to put their badge wherever they think it does them the most good. Last year, we ran an open badges forum in November after our test conference, and we had government, industry, academia represented. We think the time has come to do it again, probably in spring 2019, but really bring industry to the table, or two or three key industries that would begin to certify these competences, competencies or recognize the badges associated with them, because that's what it will actually take to crack that particular nut. What we're really looking for is to provide students with a 3D CV, a way of certifying all the deep domain skills they have and all the other ancillary skills that contribute to them as employable, good people, good citizens, worthy of being part of a team in an industry or a business. Also, could be used for entrance to graduate school if you were doing, going in that direction, too. Second piece of info from Ryan Craig's book. In the US, only 21 cents out of every tuition dollar is actually spent on instruction. So a fifth of the dollar. The rest is tied up in infrastructure, um, buildings, other expensive pieces of the puzzle. It's not a secret that our government in Ontario is looking to save money. We need to find ways to be more efficient and economical with students too. And that's another part of the work that we are doing at eCampus Ontario. One of the things that is really starting to ring some chimes in the US and in Western Canada is what's called Z-cred, or the Z degree in the US. The notion that you can take a program of study with no resource costs at all. Imagine marketing that to your students. Just pay for tuition. There are no resource costs, no books, no software to buy. Everything's free. That's another way forward. Our colleagues at Quantum Polytechnic in Surrey, British Columbia, have jumped in with both feet. They are both a training, trades and technology school, and an academic school together. They're a polytechnic. They are looking at classes with zero costs for textbooks or resources. They've been bold. They've set targets for themselves. 350 sections in 2018, 100 instructors, 30 departments, everybody's in the game. Their goal, save students a million bucks this year at their school in resource costs alone. It's a very admirable way of thinking. That is, give students the opportunity to max out on their learning, but lower the cost to zero, or at least as close to zero as possible for that. Here in Ontario, we have just launched our open library. Um, we have about 220 plus open textbooks, free textbooks in that library. The biggest collection are business texts. Um, very useful, all developed by faculty, all current, up to date, great stuff. We've also put in place um, a publishing environment in which faculty can take a book that exists, that's open and free, load it up, clone it, make changes that they like to suit their class, and then republish it. So that it's available to iPads, phones, print on demand, PDF, the web, all from one publishing system. A system called Pressbooks that 
is freely available to every faculty member in the province to use. Any instructor, Ontario, free access. And the library, too. You can publish to many formats, to your Kindle, to your iPad, to your Android. Doesn't matter. Write once, publish many. That's the mantra. Already, fundamentals of Canadian business. Our colleagues at Centennial College are using it with first-year business students. Save them 200000 bucks this semester alone. That's good news. That's the kind of stuff you can print in a local newspaper and point to and say, see, we're responsible, we know what we're doing, and this is high-quality material that our faculty have edited and customized to suit the needs of our students. Fundamentals of business, Canadian edition. Same with communications for business professionals. I bet every one of your continuing ed programs offers this course somewhere. Give your students a break. Give them a free textbook edited by faculty in Ontario. It's a good thing to do. Before we got to the summer, our open textbook library had saved students $757,000. We did a recount in early September. It was $2 million had been saved and climbing. If Centennial alone could save in one course 200000 think if every faculty member. Only 73 faculty members in the province, instructors, have adopted. What would happen if it were 730 or 7,300? That really starts adding up. Small investment, amortized broadly. It's not just books. This is a wonderful work integrated learning open education module from Niagara College that is completely adaptable by your college to use with your students. It involves job search skills, interview skills, professional expectations and competencies. There are videos, there are all kinds of activities associated with this. Freely available, funded by eCampus, built by Niagara, it's world class. <coughs> there are even bolder experiments happening out there. This is the Open Education Resource Universitas out of New Zealand. But Humber College is a member, eCampus Ontario is a member, Ryerson's a member, Contact North's a member, lots of people are members. It is the notion of making the courses freely available to students using free resources for self-study. And what students pay for are exams and accreditation only, a completely different business model, completely different. If you go to the website, you'll find a whole series of YouTube videos that explain it from the student's perspective from the institution's perspective, from an instructor's perspective. Really good way of working. Currently, they're building out micro courses for a first year of study in project management and business. They have a very simple course development model that is ultra inexpensive and produces really good looking courses that are available for self-study and that are freely available to anyone to clone and use. One of the cool things that OERU has decided is that every piece of software shall be free open source software. So instead of investing half a million dollars in a learning management system, they're delivering all of their courses in a free and open environment. They're using tools throughout that are freely available on the web, unified in a single environment to make it easy to use. The total annual software and infrastructure budget is 4800 bucks. Talk to your IT department about how much it costs to run the stuff you do and it isn't 4800 bucks. I'll tell you that. This was published yesterday, November 1st. Stephen Downs, OL Daily. 
How many universities are running all of their online services for prices like this? There are other ways of thinking out there in the world, and we need to be boldly trying some of them out. If you think the partners to OERU are insignificant, they are not. The British Open University, Athabasca University, Ryerson's Chang School, Humber College, all members of this collective, not because they want to use the infrastructure and offer the courses right now, but because they want to learn some of these lessons for the future about how to do things in radically open and transparent ways. Interesting way to work. OERU. But it's not all about text and traditional. Immersive environments are another big need. And students are highly interested in engaging in these environments. This is the team, or part of the team, I guess, at Humber, who built some of their really cool work for paramedic training. This is the kind of stuff that is world class, different, and useful to students for small periods of time in specified areas of practice. There are lots of these experiments happening around the province. Ryerson has taken a different approach with gamification through its Chang School, using games to deal with things like role play, using games to deal with nursing problems and activities, and using video to kind of create immersive decision-making environments for practitioners. These are other ways of creating small, micro modules of study that are highly useful and highly relevant to the work that people do. We need to start getting bold in these areas as well. Now, one of the things that is a bit of a missing link is that where do you find the practitioners, the instructors, who can actually deal with these new kinds of environments? If you look at yesterday's Toronto Sun, continuing education accounts for the highest proportion of contract faculty on the planet. And so our expectations for those faculty, what they know, how they teach, and the effectiveness of their teaching needs to be taken up a few notches, I would expect. They may be competent professional practitioners, but that doesn't make them competent professional educators. And we need to think differently about how we deal with that issue. One of the ways we're playing with it at eCampus, well, there's two ways. One is to build a professional learning program that is self-directed so that you might say to incoming faculty, take that self-directed professional learning program, earn the badges, and I will happily employ you. That's one thing you might do. The other is an EdTech sandbox, a place where you can play with some of these technologies in a risk-free environment to kind of learn the ropes. So Ontario Extend is our approach to personal learning that's completely research-based, done all the front-end research on it. It's driven by excellent pedagogy, constructive notions of development, and it's executed in six three-hour modules for self-directed study, for use in face-to-face -face workshops, or in collaborative study. It's openly licensed. It's available in English and French. And we've just been giving it away and running cohorts around the province almost nonstop since last fall. It's based on this notion that to become an empowered educator in 2018, there are six attributes you must possess. It's not enough to be a teacher. 
You need to be a teacher for learning. You need to understand what works and what doesn't work in the classroom and use your knowledge of how students learn to teach in effective ways. You need to find and curate resources that are useful to your students and are contextually current and make meaning for them. You need a fluency in using technologies effectively, not only to just grade the classes and put things in a grade book, but to actually design interactive events with your students that makes the conversation a two-way event. To collaborate with colleagues, to actually think about the learning that happens in your classroom and to take a scholarly approach to your teaching, and to be open to experiments that sometimes you have to try a few different things to take it up a notch. This schema was developed by Simon Bates, who's the Vice Provost of Teaching and Learning at the University of British Columbia. He's our keynote speaker next week at our TESS 2018 conference in Toronto. And we have a lot of people working in this area. It's based on four themes. Engage, <coughs> explore, extend, empower. It's like find something you'd like to do with tech. Explore it. If it, you find you like it, extend it into your classroom. Move towards a sense of empowerment and decision making on your own about what works to benefit students as learners. That's what we're looking for. And curiously, it is badged too. We have an outcomes-based approach that you can take the badge as you go along through the units of study, or you can come back later with a portfolio and challenge the badges by showing evidence and get them retrospectively. And the biggie that takes you into a Buddha state is this notion of being an empowered educator. That's where you kind of have it, and no technology coming at you will phase you in any way. You'll be ready for it. It's very cool. University of Windsor has included it right into its uh, faculty training program. That's what we're looking to see. We're looking to see more colleges think that way as well. To bring it in, perhaps with contract instructors or with uh, instructors who are only part-time and give them the opportunity to learn some new skills on their own time, but also earn the badge that certifies and lets you know that they are very competent professionals. The other piece of the puzzle are the new techs that people are looking for. Virtual reality labs, open badging systems, experiential learning. Every student shall have a meaningful learning experience prior to graduation. That was from the last government. How do you do that with the hundreds of thousands of students we have in the province? We believe it only works if you use technology. It doesn't scale any other way. We've been playing with the notion of shared services, making all of these technologies cheaper and more affordable for institutions. So we surveyed every institution in the province over the summer to ask them, what do you need? What would you like that we can, if we can drive the price down close to zero, you'd play? Our criteria was, has to have systemic value, has to save money for everyone has to be a platform that works for you to either be something new or something commodity you're already doing. Has to be cheap. Has to be able to be evaluated so that we know it's working. These are the things we asked. When we surveyed the province, we got the list of the five top priorities for shared services in the province. The five least deployed institutional technologies learning analytics, digital badges, peer-to-peer -peer assessment. Those things aren't happening in our institutions. But lots of research demonstrating that they're useful technologies. What people were looking for were more commodity things like captioning and transcription services, 
academic integrity software. <laughs> Not at the top of my list. Virtual simulations, virtual labs, yes. Those are real needs supported by research that tell us that they prepare students for a new world. I operated a shared service in British Columbia about 10 years ago. And we decided to offer multiple services to all the institutions. These are the institutions in short form around the wheel. There were 25. As it turned out, it wasn't uniform. People opted in to the service that made the most sense for them. And that's good. And when the bigs, like the University of British Columbia, opted into four services, everybody thought that must be the right way to go. <laughs> and so there's a lot of modeling that needs to be done. But we're working hard with our peer institutions in Ontario to figure out if we can come up with a way of distributing technology more equitably at a cheaper cost and the things that people want and need. Opt in. Third part, I'm rolling towards the end here. The historic disconnect between education and employer needs is a data problem. Employers haven't been clear on the skills they require and educators haven't been particularly interested in finding out. This is from Ryan Craig's book, page 138. The Candle West Foundation wrote a really great paper two years ago called Match Up. And it was a call for pan-Canadian competency frameworks that we start to get real in Canada, just like the European Union has done, to begin to outline what the competencies of the workforce might look like on a larger scale and give students something to assess themselves again. You know, that competency marketplace idea that Craig talked about? If you don't have a framework, how do you assess? It's an issue. The issue's everywhere. Waterloo has a wonderful, world-renowned co-op program. But they know it doesn't scale. Because if you get 10,000 students in co-op, you probably need 1,000 people to manage it, right? It's, it doesn't scale particularly well. We have to think differently about these work integrated, work experience programs. They've developed something called the EDGE, which is another approach they're experimenting with to give students access to employers, but in a slightly different way than co-op. And so they've been marketing it. It's Get the Waterloo Edge. Good, I like that. Many of you may have been playing with Ripen, which is a platform from Vancouver that's being used in a lot of business schools, IT schools, the creative industries, and in some of our institutions. And it's the notion of connecting faculty with workplace mentors and students with projects under the supervision of those mentors. Not as an add-on to, to the curriculum, but as part of the curriculum. So that those workplace mentors grade the student work, and it becomes part of the student's grade of record for the course. That's a nice way forward. It's based on this triangle model of educators, industry, and students. Ripen's business model was a little bit off the mark. And we've been talking to them about this and saying, look, you don't have to find all these employers for our institutions. They already have these relationships. What we need is your software platform as a service, as a shared service, at lower cost than you're asking for it now, so that we can actually expand its use and come up with a much broader approach to experiential learning for students who are currently in the classroom. And the benefit is that it satisfies that work experience need of students, and it also gives industry the ability to audition students while they're still in school. 
right? That's a key. <coughs> Ripen is doing better. We're just about to launch a pilot with Ripen with uh, French-speaking uh, institutions in the province and the federal government to find placements in the Ottawa area where that is a requirement to be bilingual. Magnet has another approach, and it's really about trying to take the competencies that students have and match them up in a way that students get alerts that their competency framework matches jobs that are on offer. That's a cool idea. Magnet out of Ryerson. These are all parts of the moving forward agenda. For us, it's about more open and collaborative practices, more building capacity through shared and collaborative services, more investment in research in the cool stuff you're doing in your institutions, and making it more visible to others. Looking ahead. In 2013, uh, the PC Caucus in Ontario <laughs> produced a paper called Path to Prosperity, Higher Learning for Better Jobs. We hope a lot of what was in that paper is still on the drawing board today. Because it talked about online learning as a key to facilitating credit transfer. It talked about openness, MOOCs. It talked about in-place learning in remote and rural communities. It talked about easy connections to the labor market. And it talked about digital badging from an employer perspective, knowing what students know. We think a lot of the things we're doing in the province, and in particular in continuing ed, is well aligned, even in a changing political environment. We're hoping that this is a great way forward. And I personally think continuing education is right on the front edge of the cool stuff that is to happen in the future. If anyone's playing catch up, it's our colleagues in the university right now. You guys are right on the front edge of it. Thank you. the opportunity to listen to David on numerous occasions and every time I do without failure I learn something new thank you so much for bringing this cutting edge new information directly to us taking time out of your very busy schedule to spend the morning with us and making sure that we're constantly at the forefront of what is happening around the world in higher education. So thank you very much. I am sure you will agree with me that David is very inspirational, and I hope you take him up on his call to CE to lead the way across the province in transforming education. So thank you again very thank much. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and now just before... Um, Oh, do you want to take some questions? I can take some questions. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry of course. You probably have questions. Sorry. Any, uh, any questions? I know I'm not in the mic. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. looking at putting lots of things free, and I understand the value of that, then what becomes our, in, our, institution, our institutions then, if we all are just part of an e-campus, for instance? Yeah, well, uh, e-campus is really a service provider. We're, we're outside of what you do. We, we don't offer courses. We don't accredit. That's your job. Our job is to kind of weld together good ideas and make them more accessible to everyone, to kind of build infrastructure that supports what the work of our institutions and to do it at as low a cost as possible. So it's really about um, doing things in a very um, streamlined and agile way 
to take us forward as quickly as we can in a streamlined and agile way at low or no cost to the institutions when, when we can make that happen. So there's an economy at work in those free and open textbooks, just to be clear. A lot of people are afraid to ask that question. Faculty get paid to write those textbooks. They get paid up front. It's not a royalty trail. They have a contract to write or adapt or update, and then it goes back into the commons for everyone to use. So there is an economy at work. Academic labor is real labor, and we recognize that. Yeah. Secondly, when we talk to employers, understanding the own amount of time in the employment industry and all kinds of different things, um, we used to have a formula called SCAP, which is Skills, Knowledge, Attitude, and Performance. It's a measure of placement. So the key thing is the recruiting industry has been doing this as, you know, for a number of years. So the gaps, as I see it, is really measuring education in terms of not lowering the cost of delivery the real cost of unsuccessful meeting the end game for the customer. In fact, I propose if we, if we really look at the Amazon customer model, they know more about what we're looking for, matching up our profile, and giving you all kinds of options that we ought to be looking at that as part of the paradigm. So the, the end result is we need to sharpen our pencils in terms of understanding Firstly, who the customer is, and what is the outcome for the individual? So from the customer's perspective, using the Amazon model, we've essentially opted in to give up considerable privacy as a part of that model. And the privacy legislation that is extant in the education system would argue against giving up that much privacy unless it were an opt-in uh, kind of environment. So I think, it, I think we could technically know who the students are, what they're doing, and how to serve them better. Um, but I think we are uh, rightfully constrained on many levels by privacy and the need to consider the individual <laughs> as part of that. Yes? Possible. I think that's quite conceivable <coughs> when you look at the bigger market in the picture. Sure. So how do we anticipate those kinds of dynamics in the world of work? Yeah, I mean, I think those are the things that the Canadian uh, Labor and Business Federation uh, look at all of those stats. It's like there are, there are organizations outside of the education system who monitor that stuff for business, industry, and government all the time. And certainly, there are plenty of opportunities to, for us to engage with those groups. The question is, um, do we? And when we do, do we use that data effectively to build out the programming that might be needed? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. But it's a worthwhile comment. So we have time for one more, if anybody has a burning question. So over here. Right over there. I'm just curious, you mentioned Magnet and LinkedIn. Is Magnet's a great tool from an employer standpoint. Right. Um, is there any way of, of taking what, where LinkedIn is going and sort of creating some kind of harmony between those devices? Because, boy, that expedites hiring really quickly, if that can happen. 
So our discussions with LinkedIn right now are concerned with badging, and that is taking, um, uh, putting authentic occasion trails into the LinkedIn profile matched against competency. So that's where we are right now. Curiously, LinkedIn used to have an API, an application programming interface that made that work really easily. And for the last 18 months, it hasn't worked ever since Microsoft bought LinkedIn, which makes us curious that perhaps Microsoft is coming up with a product or a set of suite of services that deals with that directly, because we're getting no response from LinkedIn. very much for all of your questions. Uh, Mark is going to go through some logistics with you, but just before he does that, I just want to take this opportunity to um, thank the planning committee. And there was many people involved, and they did a, a tremendous amount of work pulling this all together. So in alphabetical order, and when I call your name, could you please stand? Um, so we have Carol Alp Appleby over here for Humber. Savio, I know Savio was here, but I think he had to step out um, for a few moments. Christine Eddy, um, thank you. Again, wonderful um, keynote and a uh, great way to start our, uh, our day. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping uh, notes. Um, lunch and the closing keynote uh, all back in this room. So here, this is your central go-to spot. Um, so please come back for lunch. And then we have um, LinkedIn, Jennifer from LinkedIn will be doing our end, uh, end of day closing uh, keynote. Uh, the general schedule uh, is on the back of your name tag. So that's just sort of the, do it now. Mm. Cool. Um, so that's just sort of the general schedule for the day. Uh, if you don't have a name tag, so that was the test, um, please grab your name tag um, as you leave. And if you have it registered and have snuck in, that's okay. We accept all. Um, just let Kathy know she will add you to the registration system. Uh, you don't need to register for a workshop. It is a first come, first serve, so I expect you know, sprinting. Um, <laughs> but you might wonder what workshops are happening. Uh, you can go to the website, humber.ca forward slash HCE Conference 18. We have schedules also up on the pillars. You could just take a quick little photo of the schedule. I'm trying to save some paper. So snap a snapshot of the, uh, of the schedule on the pillars or some as you head out, and that's your schedule for the day. We have about four or five workshops running per session, so about 15 for the day. So, uh, and they cover the three streams, uh, CE operations, digital technology, and teaching and learning. So. Um, please go to what you feel is going to work for you. We have panels on the VR panel and the OER uh, panel. We have workshops on um, PLARs and pathways, uh, classroom assessment. Uh, the list goes on. So some great, great workshops. Um, if you, uh, once you leave this room, they start at 1045, the first workshop, so we have some time. So please grab some food for the walk. And I suggest a couple extra croissants so you can leave a little bread trail um, so you can find your way <laughs> back to the seventh semester. No, there will be, uh, thank you. Uh, there will be <laughs> whip signs leading you. Um, I don't trust all of them, so croissants are a second option. Um, and then once again, uh, one session this morning, back here for lunch, two more sessions after that, and then back here again for our closing and more food. So enjoy the day. Thank you for coming. Grab some food. Look for your uh, room number. Grab a photo. Once again, thank you to David. Round of thank applause. You. And have a wonderful day. Hey, Brandon.